Well, good morning to all of you again, and good morning to all of you online. Last week, I told you all that we were going to start a new sermon series this week entitled Make Space. And I also told you that this is the start of our stewardship season here at the church. And the people rejoiced. All right. Now, just a brief interjection that I want to bring up. Stewardship in our lives should not be limited to a season, right? But stewardship should be lived out every day. So keep that in mind as we go through this series and as we continue into the future, right? Not limited to a season, but stewardship should be lived out every day. Now, just so we're all on the same page as we embark on this journey together, let's remember what stewardship is. According to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, it is the conducting, supervising, or managing of something, right? All right, it is the conducting, the supervising, or managing of something, okay? Now, stewardship in the church, according to the Percival Dictionary, aka me, right? Here's my definition of stewardship. It is recognizing that we have been blessed by God with everything we have, not to hoard it unto ourselves, but to bless others so that the saving grace of God is made known throughout the world. Now, that definition is just a little bit longer than the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, right? Yeah, that's because I'm a little wordier. But, but I think that it encompasses the many aspects of how we are to manage the blessings we have. And over the course of this series, we're going to be looking at how we do exactly that. Now, I also told you last week that when we are discussing our blessings, we're talking about many things, right? Which things are things, sometimes there's things that we're comfortable talking about in church. I mean, we're comfortable talking about our time and our talents, right? We can talk about that all day long. And there's also some things that we are uncomfortable talking about in the church, like money, right? We don't like to talk about money in the church, but we do. We need to be able to talk about money in the church. So I'm glad that even after I gave that warning to you all last week, that there are so many of you all who came here this week. Thank you for not making excuses, right? So let me just be honest with you once more. It kind of sounds like I'm never honest with you when I say that, right? I mean, that's not, the, I mean, trust me, I, I really am honest with you. But of course, if I wasn't honest with you, I would say that, that you should trust me even though. Anyways, all right, so, so let me just say that my hope is that as we journey through these next few weeks, that you're going to feel both challenged and strengthened to be more generous in the stewardship of the blessings with which God has given you. But before we begin, let's join our hearts together in prayer, asking that God would reveal to each of us how we can be better stewards in our own lives. Let's pray. Great and gracious God, we come before you this morning, Lord. And Lord, we recognize that every good thing comes from you. Scripture tells us that, God, our own lives reveal that to us. But God, we also recognize that all of those good things that come from you, dear God, they're not meant just for us to hoard and to hold unto ourselves. But instead, God, we're called to be stewards of those blessings. We're called to manage them. And so, God, we ask that as we enter into this time, as we begin to understand that for ourselves, as we begin to claim that and own that in our own lives, God, we ask that you would speak to us, that you would speak to us of your truth, that you would remind us, dear God, of these, of these blessings that we have. So, God, we ask that you would continue to speak as we, your servants, listen. We pray this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. So as some of you all might know, Leslie and I purchased some land up in Dewey about a year and a half ago. Uh, we have plans of moving up there, hopefully in the near future. We have some pretty decent neighbors. I'm not going to tell you which ones are decent and which ones aren't, but uh, just kidding. I was looking at one of my neighbors up there. So, uh, But I would tell you, I absolutely love it up there. I absolutely love it up there. Now, don't get me wrong. I love it here in Bartlesville. This small city slash big town, whatever you want to call it, has been the greatest place that I have lived in my 47 years of life. It truly has. I grew up in Oklahoma City. And I lived in a couple houses in Oklahoma City. From there, I went to college in Stillwater, another great town. I lived in Orlando, Florida, another wonderful town. So much stuff to do in Orlando, right? Lived there for about 10 months. I lived in Tulsa for about a year. I lived in Owasso for about a year. I lived in Oshalata for about four years. And now I've lived in Bartlesville, the longest place I've ever lived in one, in one house for 17 years. And when Leslie and I moved to Bartlesville, we never thought that we'd be here this long. We really didn't, right? 
Because in the system that we were in, you just you don't know how long you're going to be. And especially as an associate, I never thought that I would be here this long. And so for the first 10 years of our time here, we barely even hung anything on the walls, right? We literally thought we were going to be gone. We thought we would be moved in order for me to serve another church. But like I said, I love Bartlesville. It has anything that anybody could ever want, except for a Chipotle and a Best Buy. We need a Chipotle and a Best Buy. <laughs> Other than that, I would never have to leave Bartlesville ever, right? I'm just telling you. We got the Chick-fil-A, we got that covered, Chipotle, we're getting a Whataburger. It's happening, right? But every place that I have lived has either been urban or suburban. But I've reached a point in my life where I need some space, right? And that 10 acres up in Dewey helps to create that space. You see, when I'm up there, it feels like I have room just to be. You know what I mean? When I, when you know what I mean when I say that just to be, I have room just to be? Sitting on the backside of the shop, looking over the quarry and seeing the skyline of Bartlesville while you hear the birds chirp and you see the deer running through the open field in the back. I'll tell you, it is so peaceful. It's so peaceful. It allows me the space to think. It allows me the space to pray. It allows me the space to reconnect with God. Even spending six hours on the back of a lawnmower yesterday, I felt closer to God. It allows me the space to be generous in new ways. See, I'm ready to live in that space, to call that space home. Now, while you might not be itching to move to Dewey like I am, that need for space is something that we all need, right? We all need some space in our lives. We all make space. We all need to make space in the business of life with, with all of the stressors and all of the demands that we have to just, we need that space to be able to, to have some mental freedom and to be thoughtful about how we're going to live out our lives. And after all, things go better when we have worked some space into our lives, right? We make better choices. We see things more clearly. We can be more peaceful and loving. When we make space, we have the room in our lives to truly be who God called and created us to be. We need to make space. Now, I think this is true in every aspect of our lives, but I think that it's especially true when it comes to our, our stuff and our finances. You see, we need to make space in our minds and in our hearts and in our lives to understand how our relationship with money and possessions can affect our ability to be good stewards of God's gifts. I mean, let's face it, money plays an important role in our lives, right? Right? I mean, we got to have money, right? We do. Society runs on it. And when we have money, things are good, right? They seem to, they seem to be good when we have the money, but when we don't, when we start to feel that stress, don't we? We feel that stress, and it feels like the whole world is just closing in around us. And, and let's face it, there's no room. And with no room, they're in the midst of all that. There's just this stress. And I'll tell you, there is no stress like financial stress. There's not. Recently, I read an article from Australia about this financial stress and the effects it can have on our lives. It says that money worries are a major source of stress in Australia. That's only in Australia, though. It doesn't happen in America, right? <laughs> so, but money, money's, money stress is a source of stress in Australia and here in America, and can lead to relationship problems, depression, or anxiety. Some signs that financial stress is affecting your health and relationships include one, arguing with the people closest to you about money. What's the number one argument that couples have? Money, right? Two, difficulty sleeping. Three, feeling angry, fearful, or experiencing mood swings. Four, tiredness, aches, and pains. Five, withdrawing from others. Six, feeling guilty when you spend money. And seven, I've seen a lot of seven lately, delaying health care you need due to the cost. While these are normal reactions to being under financial stress, they can affect your health if they continue for more than a few weeks. You could be at risk of developing anxiety or depression. Some people, when they, when they feel that stress, they use drugs or alcohol to help them cope. And some have thoughts of self-harm or maybe even suicide. Now, I don't share this with you this morning as a scare tactic, right? But I do it to illustrate the concerns that come with financial stress. Because I am sure that there are many here today that are feeling that stress. 
And I know based on the number of calls that we received for help over the last few months, there are many in this community that are feeling that stress. And I'll be honest with you, and I'll tell you that I know that there have been times in my own life when that stress really did a number on me. And when these stressors come, we feel that we don't have enough space, right? Like I said, we feel like we're getting closed in on. And when that happens, it impacts our ability to work, to rest, or even think clearly. So I think this is why we need to alter our view of our money and stuff. We've got to change that mindset. You see, most of us, most of us have money habits that come from a lifetime of both good and bad money lessons. And the way that we think about or handle our money starts early in life. So for just a moment, think about your earliest memory of money, right? Think of your earliest memory of money. What would that be? And as you think about that, think about another question. What is one of the lessons that you learned from that experience? As you think about your earliest memory of money, what's the lesson that you learned from that, right? For my grandparents, it was growing up in the Depression. As they grew up in the Depression, they saved everything. They kept everything, right? My grandma kept it to the extreme, but right? But then also then my grandpa and every, I mean, they became canners and they knew everything that they knew how to do to help survive, right? They made their money go. One of my earliest memories of money was when I was about seven or so and I had spent the entire day. Did you see when I announced, when I pronounced that really quickly? Entire day. The entire day picking weeds out of the front flower bed. And I wasn't just pulling the little green leafy parts off. No, I had to get the roots out, right? Something to which I still remember to this day is just getting in there. You got to pinch the roots. You got to pull them out. Make sure you get all the roots out, right? I had to do that. And so I worked on it for what seemed like forever. And once I got done, I went inside. I announced that I was finished. And then I realized that I wasn't after a very brief inspection. So I got back at it and I finally finished. But once I was done, I went back in again and I announced that I was finished. And after I passed inspection, I was told to load up the car. We were going to the store. Now, I don't remember if it was Hobby Lobby or if it was TG&Y, but what I do remember was the model that I chose. You see, I was really into plastic models of cars and planes at the time, right? I'm talking about those kinds you snap together. Not those snap together models. No, I'm talking about the ones that require that you better not get that stuff on your fingers if you ever want to separate them again, glue. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, you get them on there and you're like this for a week. That, those type of models. I remember picking out the model. I remember picking out some glue, taking it to the cash register and watching, my, watching the interaction between my parents and the cashier. So the cashier tells them the price. They pull out the checkbook to pay for the model. I grabbed the bag and the receipt, and off we went. You see, one of the lessons that I learned from that was that, that a piece of paper is just as good as actual money. I learned that lesson, right? Another lesson is that if you do the work, you're always going to get paid. Another lesson that I, said, that I learned is that there's something to be said for instant gratification. I didn't have to wait. And the last lesson that I learned is there's always going to be enough money for whatever I want. I'm not talking about just what I need, but whatever I want. Well, since those early years, I have learned that all of these lessons were false. They're not true. But yet I will tell you, there's still times that I hold on to them like they were true. You see, those early memories of, of money shape how we think about it and how we handle the money in our lives for years to come. And even if we had great money lessons in our lives, I think there's still a lot that can be learned about the balance in our spiritual life with the stressors that we find in the world. And one place that we can always turn, turn, turn to for that wisdom is in the Bible. So having said that, please join me in the Bible and to the uh, gospel according to Matthew. The gospel according to Matthew. We're going to be in the 25th chapter. And uh, this morning I'll be reading from the New International Version. Once again, we're going to be in Matthew 25. We're going to start in verse 14. I invite you to listen for the word of the Lord. Jesus tells them a parable. He says, again, it would be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold, to another, two bags, and to another, one bag, each according to his ability. But notice real quick, just what that says, right? One got five, one got two, one got one, according to their ability. Now, everybody got the same, okay? But everybody got something according to their ability. Just keep that in your mind, okay? The man, uh, then he went on his journey, 
The man who received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. A long time. We don't know how long it is, but a long time, right? The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. And then, then the man who received one bag of gold came and said, Master, I know that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, afraid, and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, that was awesome. Thank you for doing that. No, he didn't, did he? He said, Master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I'm not sown and gather where I'm not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the banker so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has been given more, they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, the parable kind of ends rather negatively, doesn't it? I mean, weeping and gnashing of teeth. So what do we need to learn from this parable so that that doesn't become the reality for us? I think that this parable can help us understand three things. Every good sermon's got three things. We've got three things this morning. They're going to help us make some space. The first thing that we need to understand is that everything, and if you're writing this down, underline it, circle it, highlight it, whatever. Everything we have belongs to God. Everything. And we have been charged to be stewards of everything that we have been given. We've been asked to be the managers or the supervisors of our blessings. Now, I will tell you, the first time that this really hit home for me, Right? This, I, I, I grew up in the church. I always heard there were to be good stewards of the gifts that we have. But, but when I had kids, man, that took on a whole nother level. You see, someone told me that my kids were a blessed gift from God. Yeah, they really are a blessed gift. I had to pause there for a moment. Think about that. But I was told that my kids were a blessed gift from God to me and that I have been placed here to be a supervisor over their lives until the day that I give them back to God. Talk about a huge weight of responsibility, right? I started having dreams. I started seeing myself before the throne of God and he asked me why I didn't do this or why I did do that when it came to Riley and Cameron. I began to see parenting on a whole new level. Now, have I been a perfect parent? You betcha I have, right? <laughs> I have two wonderful kids, and it's all because of me. You're laughing because you know the truth. It's probably more because of Leslie and a whole bunch of prayers than it is just being based on my parental skills. But to be a steward means that we have been entrusted. We have been given a level of trust to manage what we have received. In the parable, it was bags of gold in various amounts based on their ability right? Based on their ability. For us, God has entrusted each of us with certain gifts and abilities and possessions and so much more. And then God leaves it up to us to figure out how to invest those so that they might bring about some level of return. Now, I'll tell you, family, when you look at it from this viewpoint, when you look at stewardship from this viewpoint, it changes the way that we view our responsibility for our blessings. So think about it this way. How many of y'all have ever rented a place to live? You all ever rented? Everybody been a renter? Like you, you've owned a place and you've, you've opened it up. You're the owner, right? Okay, so a couple of you, you, you know what I'm talking about when I use this example. 
right? Think of God as the owner of the house or the apartment complex, and you're the renter. Seriously, think about it that way. At you, as the renter, you are responsible for taking care of the property while it's in your care, right? Or you lose your security deposit, you lose your pet deposit, you, you know, then we can also take you to court. We can get everything back out of you for all the damage that you've caused to whatever place that you're renting. The renter is the one who cleans up the spills, takes out the trash, picks up after themselves, and lets the owner know if there's a problem. You as the renter are meant to be a good steward of the space while you call it home, right? But here's the thing. Even if you live in that place your entire life, you're never going to own that space, right? You're never going to own that space as long as you're the renter. It belongs to the owner before you arrived, and it belongs to them well after you leave. Your family, it's the same way between God and us. I love the way that David puts it in Psalm 24, 1. Psalm 24, 1, this is an absolutely beautiful passage, and we talked about it ever briefly in our call to worship. The Psalm 24, 1, David says this, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Hear that one more time. It's kind of all-encompassing, right? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Everything we have belongs to the Lord. We're just the renters. We're the managers. We're the stewards of those blessings. Now, I know what you're thinking because I have thought it as well. You're saying, you know what, Chad? I work really hard for the money and the stuff that I have. I do. Does God really own all that I make and all that I have? How can that be fair? Great questions. And like I said, ones that which I have wrestled. You see, when you think about it, Whatever you do to earn money and get stuff is a gift from God. Your job is a gift from God. The talents, the skills, and even the opportunities that allow you to earn money are only yours because God has blessed you with them. God has been your silent partner, your key investor for your entire life, whether you knew it or even recognized it or not. You see, church, the very fact that God that everything belongs to God, I'll tell you, that's great news for us today. It really is. Because when we let that sink in, that we're here just here to manage the property of our lives, that we're not called to be the owners, I'll tell you, it can be a relief because in this truth, we discover that God is the absolute best provider. Now, sometimes, sometimes we feel like what God has entrusted with us is, is not sufficient, right? Right? Sometimes we're struggling, and, and when we struggle, it's hard to think of what we, little we have and, and think of that as a blessing. But there's a passage in Matthew 1 that I find comforting in those times, and I want to read it to you from the New Living Translation. Matthew 6, 31 through 33, and we've used this here in service before. Jesus says, so don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate. I love that word, dominate the thoughts of the unbelievers. But your heavenly father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, just like we sang about earlier. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. You see, as we accept this idea of every good thing coming from God, it makes space to really live in gratitude for what we have. And we recognize that it's an honor to be entrusted with it. You see, it's both humbling and empowering to acknowledge that we are not the owners of our possessions, that we're just the managers. So the first key to embrace is to embrace the truth that everything in my life actually belongs to God and has been entrusted to me. The second key that we get from this parable is that God wants us to be good managers with what we've been entrusted in the parable, there were three managers, right? Two who heard those beautiful words, well done, good and faithful servant. And then there's one who was stripped of his duties and thrown out into the presence of the owner. Now, I know it's kind of a duh moment when I say this, 
But God wants us to be more like the first two guys and not the last guy, right? God wants us to be good managers with what we've been given. And honestly, I think that's something we all can do better at. But hear me, it's not about being good with numbers. It's not about having an entrepreneurial spirit or having an unnatural understanding of hedge funds. There's only a few people that know that anyways. But becoming a good manager of our finances and being good stewards of God's blessing is something that we need to be diligent about improving every day of our lives. However, the number one thing that stops us is fear. Just like the last manager of the parable, right? It was fear that stopped him. And most of us, when we face it, I mean, most of us have felt like this manager at one point or another, right? Whether we have a lot or whether we have a little, we find ourselves acting out of fear of maybe judgment or fear of failure, fear of loss, when we make choices about our finances. Well, the only way to reduce fear is to bring light to them, right? It's like a parent who goes into the room of the child when the child claims that there's a monster in the closet. So what do you do? Nowadays, you take your phone and you turn on the flashlight on your phone and you shine it in the darkest parts of the closet, revealing the truth that there is no monster. Helps to relieve those fears. But when it comes to our finances, one fear is, man, I'm barely making it. I don't know if I'm going to have enough. Fear is if I give this, if I spend that, what happens when the engine goes out in the car? I could be here all day sharing a list of fears and fears and fears. But instead of focusing on those fears, we need to remember that everything is a gift from God and God will provide for our needs. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be smart. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that we should ignore sound financial practices like John Wesley's three rules for money. He had three rules for everything. He had three rules for money, right? And he is very simple. Earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can, right? Boom, three rules, go out and live them. But in addition to these, we need to remember that God entrusted you with what you have for a reason. God has entrusted you with what you have for a reason. You see, part of being a good steward, being a good manager of God's blessing is faith faith, which reflects how deep your connection is to the very heart of God. Yes, we need to be smart with our blessings, but we don't need to live in fear. You see, when we start to understand that everything is God and we're just the managers, then it becomes that, then, then we start to understand that it's very clear that every financial decision that we make is really a spiritual decision. Beyond that, every financial decision also becomes a powerful opportunity to be a trustworthy manager of God's great resources. Now, I don't know if you thought about this or not, but our financial decisions are very interesting things. You see, our financial decisions help us to know what's important in our lives. And how we manage our resources speaks volumes about whether we really put trust in God or we put trust in things for the security and the joy that we all desire. So now that we know that everything belongs to God and God desires us to be good managers of the things that he's placed in our lives, that's gonna bring us to the last key to having more financial space. And this is really the encouraging part, family, it really is. And this is that key. Resting in the freedom that comes with being a good manager. Resting in the freedom that comes with being a good manager. You see, one of the things that I have learned is that as we get better at being stewards of our finances, it helps us to make space to find that breathing room, especially when it happens around our money, right? Even if we don't suddenly have more money, right? We aren't afraid of facing our finances. And when, we don't, when we're not afraid of facing our finances, then it takes a blessed room in our lives. And with that extra space, other areas of our lives begin to flourish. Like gratitude. I said that before, right? Gratitude. You say, when we have worked in this kind of space, this thankfulness and this gratitude and praise in various forms, they're going to they're start to creep into our lives from every angle. You're going you're to start to see God as the provider of everything. You'll start to appreciate God even more. Your finances are no longer going to stress you out. Instead, they'll continually point you back to your loving Heavenly Father who loves to give good things to all of His children. You see, family, Each of us have been entrusted with many blessings by none other than God, the very one who created everything. 
has given you everything. And God is asking us to be good stewards of those blessings. Now, I know that might seem like a daunting task, right? Especially when it comes to our finances. But hear me clearly. There's no need for fear. There's no need for fear. And when we step past that fear, we find freedom for our lives. So as I close, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to begin to change the way you see your money. I want to challenge you to begin to change the way you see your stuff, your time, your energy, your talents. I want to change the way that you see the blessings in your life. I want to challenge how you see the whole of your life as it relates to God. How is God calling you to be generous with all of your blessings? What do you need to do with that that you've been entrusted so that when the time comes and you stand before the throne of God, you too will hear those words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray.